Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Cara. Vanessa, I'm so happy to have Erica Suter on the podcast today. She comes at this work that she does, which is she would decline the parenting expert title, as would we. And that's one of the reasons we really like her. Um, but she she comes at this work of understanding parenting and advising um, parents as a journalist. She's actually someone who asks questions and listens to answers. And she doesn't just do it here and there. She is speaking to hundreds, if not thousands of parents every single year. And as a result, has evolved into a role of of really a, a nationally recognized voice in parenting news and parenting advice. And we we invited her onto the podcast to reflect on the intersection of her own personal story, which is that she has kids who are two kids living under her roof who are many, many years apart in age, and also to reflect on the advice and knowledge she has collected from so many parents over the years about navigating life when there is a wide age span. So Erica's a journalist. She's an author. She wrote How to Have a Kid and a Life. And she's a frequent contributor to Good Morning America and tons of other outlets. And all of her advice and insight is based in really, really good research and data So when you listen to this episode and you hear how incredibly thoughtful she is in approaching really complex topics like race and bodily autonomy and all of these things that we talk to both our younger kids and our older kids about, don't lose heart if you're like, I'm not nearly as thoughtful or as informed or as deliberate as Erica is. Well, she does this for a living and she researches this and she speaks to parents all over the country about this for a living. So we're going to join with her and learn from her. And her advice just sort of trips off the tongue and you're like, oh my God, I would have needed several hours to come up with this. So join us, enjoy it. I found it a really fascinating conversation. I think, Cara, for you, it was personally really interesting as you yourself grew up in a household with a with a big age gap between you and, and your younger brother, who we adore. So get ready for a really interesting ride. Erica, it is so fantastic to have you on with us. Welcome. Thank you. So excited to be here. So I basically... I cornered you at a big event with like thousands of people and we started talking and, you know, you are a parenting expert in quotes because Cara and I always laugh about that term because it's like, and I know you well enough to know that you have a sense of humor about how ridiculous that term is because like who the hell can ever be an expert in parenting, but you are expert in talking about ways to parent in positive and constructive and informed ways. But the reason I was so desperate to have you on the podcast, and I I think I texted Cara, literally I walked out of this event and I texted Cara, I was like, okay, I have the person, is because you are parenting two boys with a very large age gap and nobody in between. So I have four kids in seven and a half years. Cara, you have two kids in three years? 22 months. In 22 months. So you have the opposite of a large age gap. And Erica, you have two kids with an eight and a half year age span, a seven-year-old and a 15-year-old. Which is the age gap I grew up with, with my little brother. There was no one between, we are, we are nine years almost exactly. So that age gap, uh, it was very familiar. Please tell me that you love him now. (laughs) He came out, my best friend, like that was just temperamentally. Um, we are so close, but my friends who have similar massive age gaps with their siblings as adults, regardless of what the path was through childhood, have tended to land where my younger brother and I landed long ago, which is really bonded and connected. Yeah. yeah. I'm really hoping that as adults that they stop 
fighting <laughs> and arguing. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot of it's very typical, right? I see it with siblings who are close to an age. In my mind, since the one was so much older, he would have been more nurturing and want to take care of him and be like kind of built in babysitter. None of that. He's just annoyed 24 seven at the existence of this little child. <laughs> so we're going to get into all of the beautiful and messy permutations um, of all of it. So one is uh, finishing ninth grade and one is finishing first grade. That's right. Okay. And so the reason I was so desperate to have you come on the podcast is because on every single stop on our book tour, and we spoke in front of thousands and thousands of parents, there were a couple of questions that came up in every room. The question of how do I handle parenting a kid through this stage of life when I have a big age gap in my household between my two kids? How do I handle it? What do I do? And it's funny because we could usually predict what people were going to ask. Like if you had said to us before we launched our tour, what, you know, what do you think are they going to be the top five most common questions? We would have been able to predict, I think the four other questions. I would never have predicted that this would be the most common question. Cara, would you have predicted that? No. And the, the real context around the question was if I give one child information Will they dump that information on the younger sibling in a way that's too much for them? Or can I have, we have family conversations about everything as a group. At what point do I or don't I have family conversations about all of this stuff? All of this stuff, by the way, referring to every physical, emotional, social, and relational change that happens through puberty. And Vanessa and I would be like, hmm, okay, let's break this down a little bit. But this is what you are living this mm-hmm. is what you are really experienced and expert at. And so I think this is what makes um, you particularly phenomenal as a resource to our audience because the number of people who are wondering the best way through, they're not asking for, a, they know there's not one right answer, but they're mm-hmm. asking for a best way through. Yeah, And so I think we should start there with your guiding principles, like how, what's your North Star when it comes to dividing and conquering versus having conversations that you try to keep quiet with your older son? So there's two parts to that uh, question I'm going to answer. The first is I am a code switch parent. So that means at any given time, I am parenting two different kids, two different needs, and I have to switch up, right? A 15 year old is going through something completely different than a first grader. And, and it's so drastic. They're both having tantrums and they need two different types of ways to dealing with them. So for me, uh, because I have chosen to have kids so far apart and it was a choice, right? I originally I thought it was one and done. And then I thought, Oh, you know what? Let's just go ahead and see if this works. <laughs> and it worked. And I have a, a, a little one. <laughs> yeah. And so I am very, um, intentional about the way I speak to them both because uh, their, their needs are so different and not right. just the age, their emotional needs are different. One is very sensitive and bookish. The other is very sporty and type A and that, that's the little one. So I'm two different parents in any given span of five minutes. And I accepted that and I kind of deal with it. And that's the way it helps me be present for both of them without having to shove one to the side for like an hour um, and then kind of reset. No, I'm kind of constantly functioning on this. That's an amazing framing. I think a perfect place to begin because you haven't really made it about age at all. What you're recognizing is what so many parents come to recognize very quickly, which is they have different humans living Mm -hmm. under their roof if they are raising more than one child at a time. And just starting there with that premise of they were never going to be the same person. They were always going to have different interests, different strengths, different learning styles, different whatever. Um, that That is a really helpful framing. And then you can layer on the age on top of that. But I love that phrase code switch because that's how it feels. 
Yeah, that's and I think when people have kids close together, they just think it's going to be easy. They're going to be plop them down together. They're going to play together. They're going to be best friends, and it's going to be easy. And so many women and men that I interview, that's not the case, mm. right? They're battling with these two different kids for diff- two different reasons. There might be learning differences or just whatever kids are going through at the time. So I think it's really important for parents to be more conscious of what their kids are like and what their kids need. And it takes practice, right? Because that's not how most of us were raised. I mean, first of all, you're like, you're so much more deliberate and conscious. I mean, I now, my oldest is 21 and I feel like, okay, I've kind of like, now I'm pretty good at this, but you're, I feel like your seven-year-old benefits from the lived experience. And we'll get into like, essentially, I'll let you think about this question, but I'm going to ask you another question, which is like, do you think you're a better parent to your younger kid than your older kid? Because you're, yeah. Okay. So we'll get into that. (laughs) Um, But one of the things I'm wondering is, and this is the question that comes up a lot is what can you successfully do with them together? Like what conversations can you successfully have where you're not code switching, which is such an Mm -hmm. interesting use of the term because we so often think of it more as like a racial Mm -hmm. concept, right? Like switching between different cultures or for me, like my religious identity and my secular identity, like, but you don't think of it as a parent within your own house. So it's a really fascinating way of um, framing it. I love it. Where do you not need to code switch? Where can you have conversations where everybody's kind of there as themselves participating. So there are a few topics that, especially now that he's seven. Now, when you're, if you're dealing with like a three-year-old and a 10-year-old, the conversations, it's kind of hard to blend the conversations right. together. But the older you get when you have like a kindergartner and up, I think there are certain things that we have just been open about. And one is safety. We live in New York City. Um, we talk about safety, not talking to strangers, avoiding people who are acting strange, homelessness. It's everywhere. Mm-hmm. We don't, we, we feel like if you're growing up here, you need to be aware and care and be empathetic. We talk about bullies with them both. Uh, obviously the resolution or the way to handle it is a little different, but we definitely have conversations with them both together about it. Uh, the death of a loved one. That's mm. definitely something that we feel that we don't shy away from. And, and then also because of our particular family, uh, ethnicity and, and racial background, we talk about race. We talk about being different and what that means and how that makes us feel. So in another household, it may be talking about gender identity mm. or same sex uh, families or, or whatever. But I think that, you know, kids need to be aware of the world around them, how they're perceived in the world around them, but also they need to feel comfortable expressing how they feel. And if they're feeling anxious or sad or even even excited about something. Yeah. So we leave that, we want to make sure we create that space for them. Having conversations like, for instance, did you and your partner or did you and the kids come up with those? Did you sort of deliberately make a choice of what you were or weren't going to talk about or as life presented you with circumstances that you were like, okay, I think this is something we can talk about as a family. Like, how did you come to that sort of set of categories that you you talk about as a family? I'm glad that you asked that because with the first child, it was very different than with, <laughs> with the two of them. <laughs> now we kind of, we the world around us is, is moving so fast and so many things are happening and kids on playgrounds are having so many discussions. So we kind of, I hate the phrase, meet them where they are. <laughs> But I love but it's it because relevant. it's also necessary. It's right. absolutely necessary. Like I wish there was another way to say it, but that is exactly what we do. If, you know, my little one comes home and he's like, you know, why are there protests in the street? Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, we heard sirens. Was someone okay? Or, you know, or he sees the news and says someone was shot. Like if he asks questions, we answer them. And the teen's there. And obviously the teen is much more aware and cognitive of like, Everything that's happening, he understands the world a lot differently. But um, we feel like it's important that we don't lie and we don't shield a child who's asking about something that's mm-hmm. happening uh, too much. Because I, I think one of the problems is, is when you shield your children or you coddle them, you hover and you protect them too much, they're just not prepared for the world when it hits them. Right. And that kind of happened with my younger one. And I'll tell you, we didn't talk about race. We just thought, oh, he's too little. He's, I think he was nine at the time. And we thought, well, why scare him about 
police officers and police brutality or, or, you know, someone calling him a racial slur because he's nine. That was our thought. And I got a call from his camp. It was a field trip they had taken to Midtown, and um, a white man came up to him, hit him in the head, and called him the N-word. Oh, he my God. Oh, and, my God. And I was like, at first, I was like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> it was so shocking. But we had never talked to him about how people would view him or treat him differently, you know, because he was a little child. He was tiny. Like, he wasn't even, like, a big nine-year-old. And so we we used to avoid those conversations, right? And we'd turn off the news. There's something going on. Like we don't want Lex to to hear about it or be worried about it. So that kind of taught me that if your child if if your child is just exposed to something and they have a natural question about it, it is okay to get into it because then I had to have a conversation with him that was much scarier yeah. and much more traumatic than if along the way I had maybe talked about race a little bit more and racial differences. Um, And he, it was just, it was also traumatizing for us. So of course, of course. So you're, what you're saying is something that a version of something we say all the time that I think is really important, which is it's never too late to get into these conversations. Right. I mean, obviously we all learn with our lived experience Mm -hmm. when earlier might be better. And sounds like you had this incredible opportunity to take a do-over the second time and you've done it over the second time. But can we spend a couple of minutes talking about what it felt like and sounded like in your house when you hadn't had any of those conversations and here you are and the circumstances have presented this, this very upsetting, radical situation that you weren't expecting at all for a nine-year-old to handle. How did it go? What advice can you give parents for getting through conversation mm-hmm. when you when you haven't prepared for it? Yeah. Uh, it was hard because we didn't quite know what to say. We didn't want to scare him more, but then we wanted him to be aware. So we just we sat him down and we talked about, well, you know, some people might be afraid of you or may or may not like you because of the color of your skin. And that's not right, but that's the way some people are. And, you know, you have people around you that you can go to for help and support. You can talk to me, you can talk to your teachers and your friends. You know, we tried to make it, we tried to be honest, but not you know, it'd be scary, but it was a little scary for him. Like it's hard for a child to think that like his skin is what people hate. To think, and I mean, this is your lived experience for me as a white woman, it's not my lived experience, but to think about like, that is the proactive conversation you have to have with your nine-year-old is just so, I mean, we cover a lot of tough conversations and we're going to get into a couple of them like conversations about porn. And I always say to people like, (laughs) you may be screaming inside, but you got to like fake it till you make it and Mm -hmm. have the conversation. But to have to say to your child, like someone may not like you, someone may hate you, someone may say something or attack you because of the color of your skin, that is the ultimate fake it till you make it situation where your heart is just, I would imagine your heart was utterly broken. I mean, it's terrifying to have that happen. It reminds me of a really powerful conversation we had a couple of years ago with an author who we love, um, Uju Asika, who is based in the UK. And she wrote a book right at the beginning of the pandemic is when it was published. So it it didn't make it out into the world in the way I think it should have called bringing up race. And the subtitle is how to raise a kind child in a prejudice world. Mm. Um, and her, her lived experience is similar to yours on a different continent. Um, and then her follow-up book is called raising boys who do better, which um, is sort of this beautiful follow along about just the generalizing of all the lessons that she's learned and then taking it in another direction. I think what I want people to hear, what I'm hearing you say, what I want people to hear is just because you didn't have the conversation before then didn't mean that you weren't the go-to person once it happened, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And and have you have you been able subsequently over all these years to have multiple conversations with him, even though 
this happen, right? Okay. So. Oh yeah. I mean, we have, we talk about it all the time. And I think that, and this is another thing that a lot, a lot of parents won't face, but he likes to wear hoodies and I'm terrified of him wearing hoodies. Yeah. So I'm like, please don't put your hood up. Yeah. Don't put your hands in yeah. your pocket in the store. Just like, you know, there's, there's so many things that, um, yeah. when you're parenting a black teen boy yeah. that are kind of frightening that other parents wouldn't don't even think about have to worry about. Right. Um, so it's, so we have lots of conversations about race, especially if there's something that happens in the news. He's very aware. Um, we have conversations about police officers. He's going to start driving soon. So we have to have a whole conversation yeah. about what happens if you're pulled over. 500 um, conversations. Yeah. And yeah. so of course he gets annoyed. He's like, okay, mom, I know. So for him, obviously the conversations are much more direct now. With a little one, we talk about you know, you're different. You have different skin color and our family's different. And this is our family's heritage. And this is, so we, we just, we talk about difference in terms of race and ethnicity. Like we're an Afro Cuban family, mm -hmm. right? So we just make sure that there's a lot of pride and acknowledgement in that difference. And that is not something we necessarily did with the first one at that stage. So that's the difference. Now we're not telling him someone might attack you. Like that's right. not what you tell a seven year old. But um, we also let you make sure he knows that, oh, if something, anyone ever bullies you or anyone ever says something to you, go to a teacher, go to a grown up you trust, tell us when you come home. Like these are things that we're, I don't want to say anticipating him needing, but I think we would be negligent parents if we didn't help prepare him for even conversations. You know, someone might say like, oh, I don't I don't know any black people or I don't like to play with black, you know, whatever someone might say, because kids will say silly things and they yeah. do like, you know, so we just feel like we were trying to give them like the emotional, emotional fortitude mm -hmm. to deal with whatever may come. That's right. So you took a do over with the younger one mm -hmm. in terms of your approach of that. And, and I will say, and I, I want to explore some other themes, but I will say, if that person hadn't physically attacked your older child, the camp wouldn't maybe have felt obligated to report it and to let you know. And you might not have known that somebody just, just as terrifying said something really frightening and offensive to your kid. And so you got the report you knew from the camp, but like maybe your kid wouldn't have come home and told right. you what had happened. Maybe you wouldn't have known. Maybe like... It's like at school where they have to tell call you if your kid gets hit in the head, but like yeah. they don't always tell you if there's an argument on the playground and some <laughs> one kid says something horrific to another kid, right. right? Like, so in a bizarre way, it was like it it educated you to like how shocking even you might have known how like shocking the world is, but in this particular situation, oh my god, it's that shocking! I have to have this yeah. conversation with my nine year old. Um, yeah. so. Yeah. When when we think about the do over concept, right? We we had mm -hmm. one approach with an oldest and another approach with with a much younger sibling. Um, I'm curious if you did things differently when you talked about like bodies or um, you know anatomy or mm -hmm. consent or like some of those biggie conversations that we spend all day every day yep. talking about. 100%. You know, when you're a first time parent, there's so many things you worry about. And it's never those conversations <laughs> that when you're like, you're like, Oh, my God, let me just keep him alive. I was like, Oh, God, what am I doing? So um, those conversations, I felt like were kind of dictated by the school, right? The school is going to do a lesson on bodies. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh, Okay, you know, what book are they getting? We'll get it at home, that kind of thing. And then also in the last decade, the climate has changed so much yeah. about consent and what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And kids need to learn at an earlier age. So, yeah, we absolutely tell, like, you know, my seven-year-old, you know, you have to ask before you touch someone. You can't swat a friend on the on the bottom, you know, kids do silly, you know, silly things, but we talk about what is okay touching, not just what he would do, but also what people do yeah. to him. Yes. Uh, and so those conversations, I mean, we've been having those since he was like five. You know, and how and does your oldest handle, like, is, does your oldest look on and be like, either A, you never talked to me about that. Why don't, why didn't you talk to me about that? Or, and this is maybe mm -hmm. the more likely scenario, like, why are you talking to him about that? Like, you you don't need to talk about like, wait till he's older. Like, is there sort of this yeah. weird in between sort of parent, non-parent, parent role of the of right. the older one? 
No, he's actually like, yeah, tell him. Like he's he's from this he's from this like I don't know where he went to school, but they're super like super woke, and they're like, yeah, he should know that you should do this, you can't do this, and the consent. And sometimes I have to tell him to stop talking about certain things in front uh-huh. of the seven year old because he'll like tell him all kinds of things that he won't understand. Like so, what? So we were talking about. It was when he he was like four, Aiden was four, and Lex was talking about um, gender reassignment surgery or mm. uh, sex reassignment, and I was like, "Well, I, I don't." <laughs> I, I was like, I really don't know what I'm going, what I'm going to say yet. So please, <laughs> he's not asking about it. So I mean, he and it doesn't that. come from a bad place, right? It comes oh. from a place of, uh, frankly, love and curiosity and figuring out. Yes. He's like, uh, if I'm working through this information, my little brother yeah. probably wants to work through it too. It doesn't matter that he's four, you know. Right. And so, um, and so we live, you know, we live in New York City. Like the kids are aware of every people who make every choice or have every kind of lived experience or who are born whatever way they're born. And so nothing's, it's not like things are new to him. I just didn't necessarily think he was ready for the bio, like the explanation of what happens during a surgery. Right. Do you know what, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's, they don't even understand a lot of the biology and physiology of themselves. Like they're still like, Oh, look at this. Like my joints yeah. bend. That's so interesting. And that's like the, <laughs> you know, the next level, but you do bring up an interesting point and I don't want it to get buried because one of the questions that comes up so often, Erica, from people is I want to be able to talk to my older kid about certain topics and not my younger kid. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to confer shame on the topic. I don't want to make it seem like this is verboten in our house. I just need to be able to like navigate it. And you use some language that I want to amplify in this conversation, which is you said, I haven't figured out yet how I'm going to talk to him about it. So I don't want it to be a group conversation yet. And I, I want you to talk a little bit about how you came up with that response because it walks such a delicate line. And I think we can like dig a little deeper to help parents navigating the same kind of age, age range yeah. and tricky topics. Yeah. So I'll start by saying a lot of it comes from my own research. I interviewed, I interview hundreds of parents every year and I kind of pull together their experiences, what works, what doesn't work, what has, you know, what has made parenting easier for them. And I think one of the things that a lot of parents go into when they have two kids or three kids, they treat them all the same way. They all get, you know, even when they have big, you know, age gaps, you know, if this rule, this is a house rule, it's the same rule for everyone. And I don't necessarily think that works when you have kids who are from two different generations <laughs> and their age difference is so vast. And so everything I do with them when I'm teaching them something or explaining something to them is very deliberate. It's very thought through. So I can have a conversation with my 15, 13, 14, 15 year old, and we can get into the nitty gritty of biology or science or social issues. Now, a five-year-old going to need to process it completely differently. And they're going to need right. different language. And I think parents have to start thinking about, you know, when you have a huge age gap, it's okay if you don't treat them exactly the same because they're not the same for many reasons. And they're not both ready for the same kind of conversation, the kinds of same kinds of punishments, the same kinds of expectations. The and same bedtimes, the same, yeah. the same hygiene rituals, the same, yeah. right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't say to a a five year old, you know, yeah, sure, you can stay up till you know fill yeah. in the blank time and you know play video games this long and this that and the other. I mean, there are there are limits we put because in the name of health and safety, and right. and you're just extending those limits in the name of health and safety. That's right. And a lot of parents talk about fairness, and I'm like, well, it's not mm. fair. It's not supposed to be fair, right? Because a right. teenager needs something completely different than a five year old, and it's okay that they learn that they're going to be treated a little differently because of their age. And that's actually an explanation we give all the time. And a little one will be like, well, well, Lex can have his devices, and I'm like, well, Lex is older, and he's allowed. When you get to be Lex's age, you can have a device more often. So, and I, can I ask about having the dynamic you have, which is. Um, one who is somewhat chronically annoyed by another. And I'm guessing your your younger son worships your older son is mm-hmm. usually the way it goes or not always, but um, more often maybe than it goes in the other direction. 
Um, I'm wondering if if it's ever been successful in your home to engage Lex, being your older one, in doing some of the conversation that as you're towing into certain conversations, if he's so interested in having a conversation as a group, letting him lead in an age appropriate way. So what I mean by that is, you know, I was raised in this house where I have two older brothers and one younger brother and the younger brother is nine years younger. And one thing I really flash back to often is that I was so, um, I felt that it was my job to share information with my little brother. Mm. And it was not on a need to know basis. It was on a, he needs to know right now basis. (laughs) That was just my personality. Vanessa is shocked. And, um, and so that's how it went. And my mom really couldn't do anything about that because that's how I was born and who I was. So she started leaning into me sharing the information in a way that was appropriate for my little brother. So it at least honored that. And I'm wondering if you've had any luck or even made any attempts, given that it's a different dynamic in your household, mm-hmm. handing the baton a little bit, but with with some guardrails, right? Like maybe right. you're at the dinner table or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, you also have to kind of know your kid yes. and my older totally. one would just kind of like, just let it flow and wouldn't put in, he wouldn't respect the guardrails. If it's a conversation that he's passionate about or a topic he has really strong opinions about. So, you know, of course I let him teach my little one how to play Mario Kart or teach him how to be respectful, like let ladies out of the elevator first or something like that. But if it comes to like social issues, I'm always like, on guard for what he's going to say next, because I also don't believe you should expose too much too soon. That's right. But if I had a different child, like if he was like a, a, a different personality type, then I might be more open to him teaching him the ways of the world. Erica, you mentioned earlier that you're essentially raising two kids in two different generations. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as you well know, um, and some of our listeners know, but the kids born 2010 and later are considered Gen Alpha and the kids mm-hmm. born 2011 and, and earlier are Gen Z. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're just, researchers are just starting to like observe and understand that the behaviors and habits, and frankly, a lot of them are interested for commercial reasons, but, you know, in the work we all do, we're interested in it for other reasons. What are the differences in your perspective for raising a kid, a Gen Z kid versus a Gen Alpha kid? You know, there's so many interesting things that have happened in the last five years um, in terms of politics, what's happening socially, and then the pandemic. And so I am so curious as to what these kids are going to be like as mm-hmm. adults, because there's so many things that have happened that um, we couldn't have predicted. I think that when, when you have an older one, they have grown up in such a dynamic where their voices, no matter what you want to say, no matter what your opinion, your voice deserves to be heard. And you deserve to have a, a, a way for your opinion to be amplified. And you know they cannot be silenced, right? I don't know what this means for the next generation. I don't know if it means that there'll be a backlash to so much. Mm-hmm. Of, you know, it's, it's kind of like it's social media. Everyone says everything, no matter what, no matter what their opinion is, from whether, whether it's research, whether it's true or not, there's so much information out there. And I wonder if this younger generation will have the same obsession with social media and the same obsession with everyone having a voice or will they be more interested in (laughs) fact-based information or I don't know um Aiden is so young he's seven so his his interaction with the world is pretty much it's dictated by school and and Mm -hmm. us and home and then we we don't really let him use the iPad very often he can you know, when we're at dinner, I'll put on a, cart- a cartoon that he really loves or, or if he's here um, eating alone, because sometimes our schedules are so crazy, I'll, I'll let him watch a cartoon. I have to answer that when he's exposed more to the mm-hmm. world. But I do think that both generations are going to be very open to people's choices. I just don't know how that's going to play out in terms of like how they communicate with each other. And I, I do wonder about 
the AI of it all and Mm -hmm. sort of, you know, gen alpha will come of age, will go through adolescence with, with bots that are everywhere. And I mean, you're a journalist, it's got to make you cringe even more (sighs) than it makes us cringe because some of this information will be factual Mm -hmm. and some will not. And yet it will be presented in a way as if it all is even more than it is on websites and social media posts today. Yeah. I do see among even some of the older teens, um, some of my son's friends, there's there's a backlash that's Mm -hmm. happening in terms of like, sometimes they don't feel like there's some things they can't say. And then I I feel like there's some of them are becoming a little bit more conservative, which I find it really interesting. So I'm waiting to see how this all plays out as well. Yeah, it's funny. My oldest, my between my oldest and my fourth, there's a seven and a half year age difference. And my oldest treats his littlest brother like, you know, he's the my oldest is the font of all wisdom. And he'll say Mm -hmm. things like, you know, I just feel so bad for him. Like, I just feel like their generation is like really screwed. And I'm like, dude, you're like seven years older, but somehow he's decided (laughs) that he's like, you know, old man time and is, but I think that also feels protective for them to like distance Mm -hmm. themselves from, even if they're the siblings to feel there's a desire to feel a little bit superior. One of the things I noticed with my kids, Erica, particularly the oldest and the youngest was for a long time, the youngest was like his little mascot and he would Mm. do everything he wanted. And he literally was like his little mini me. And then my youngest started to like exercise some autonomy and sort of function and, you know, on his own. And my oldest was like really upset. Like he had this sense of grief that his little buddy wasn't his minion. His his minion, literally. (laughs) Have you encountered that yet? Are you seeing that with your kids? Or do you feel like your oldest is just like, please, I don't care what happens. Just like, give me some space. Right. Well, I, one thing I noticed is that his friends look at Aiden as their little mascot. They mm-hmm. like to teach him the little dances and, and the language he's already using in kindergarten or like sus and riz and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my oh, God. Oh, join the club. <laughs> mine, <laughs> was, mine was using the F word in kindergarten. So if <laughs> sus and riz is the worst that happens, you're, you're lucky. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I do know, I, but I, what I noticed was there was a jealousy. There was a jealousy of the attention the little one got uh, because he was much more outgoing and much more would insert himself in situations and be like, hey, like, I want to come. I want to play or come hang out with me, guys. And my older one is much more reserved. Mm-hmm. So um, I saw a conflict there where the older one was often like, ah, I mean, can you take Aiden somewhere so my friends and I can just hang? He won't right. bother us. And I think it mm-hmm. was um, he just didn't want the little one getting the attention of his friends. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can relate to that. My yeah. younger brother was like always the life of the party. And I was he like, still is. He, he is still. <laughs> and well, you met America, you know, he said he is the life of the party. <laughs> and my younger yeah. brother is perennially nine. So um, not in real life, of course, he's a grown up, <laughs> but um, I'm in my mid 50s. And when my mid 50s friends say, How old is he now? They think I'm going to say nine. And I'm like, right. He's in his mid 40s. Right. No way. So there is that that thing that that sort of a uh, mascot type element that mm-hmm. travels with the younger one frankly for decades and sometimes they lean into it and sometimes mm-hmm. they really don't like it i think in scenarios where at least for for me in particular i am very careful about the self esteem of both and both of them feeling like um important or and not in like a entitled way, mm. but feeling like they're celebrated because they're, they're so good at different things. And sometimes the more outgoing personality, it's easier to like give that person accolades or to mm-hmm. give that person attention. And so um, I'm very deliberate. My older one's a poet. He's a writer, you know, so I make sure to make them feel good about what they're both good at. And I think Eric- that's really important when you have kids who are so different. I want to, I mean, you are so thoughtful. Like every time we interview an expert who's as thoughtful as you are, it makes me think about all the things that I should have done differently, but now it's too late. So now I can just appreciate the way you're doing things with your kids. Um, But you talk about something in your book um, and it's 
fantastic How to Have a Kid and a Life, a survival guide. And in the opening, you start to frame the concept of of motherhood and how we become, Mm -hmm. we are essentially reborn as human beings when we become parents. Um, And I think at no stage is that true. I mean, yes, when you first have a child, but at no stage is that as true as when you are parenting adolescence and you are navigating and you even use the metaphor of puberty, the sort of the roller coaster, the ups and downs, and you refer to the concept of, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, matrescence. matrescence? Yeah, matrescence. Yeah, matrescence, matrescence. which yeah. was coined um, by a medical anthropologist. I mean, these are the kind of people that Erica references in, in her work. She goes like deep in the intellectual um, and research annals to, to help us reframe motherhood. But this concept of becoming reborn, can you talk about like for those people listening who are in in the SHIT, right? They're feeling mm-hmm. like underwater. It was very reserved for you. That was that was me being that was me being mature and not saying the full word out loud, which normally <laughs> is not what happens. But I want I want people to hear some of your reassurance and the way you frame becoming even more versions of ourselves through mm-hmm. this process of caring for these kids. Can you give people Close us out with a little yeah. a little reassurance. Yeah. I think it's really important that people go into parenthood or if they're in the midst of it right now, that they understand that you are going to be a different mother at every stage of your child's development because a newborn needs something different than a kindergartner, then that child needs something different than an adolescent, tween, adulthood. And so you have to be open for the fact that you're going to change and things are going to be hard. But that that um, challenge, when it gets hard, is going to help you grow and become a better parent. You know, I have developed my philosophy on parenting from my own mistakes, right? What I think I've done that I could do better. And then I ask questions. I ask questions of the people around me. And I learn and I grow from other people's mistakes and challenges. And so I think that um, no one does it perfectly. I, I love that how you phrase the parent expert. If there was one perfect way of being a good parent or raising perfect kids, we would have put that in a book and everyone would be following it and everyone's kids would be well adjusted and perfect and happy and everyone would be a great happy parent. And that's just not the case. Every family needs something a little different. And you can pull from all of this knowledge to find what works for your family. And I think that's what's really important. You don't follow someone on Instagram who's like, you know, baking fresh crepes every morning or making fresh crepes for their kids. (laughs) That's not me. I'm like, Ego waffle, please. <laughs> and I told my little one, I was like, oh, Mbappe eats these every morning. So you should have them too to get him to have an For Ego those waffle. of you who don't know, Mbappe is the one of the world's best soccer <laughs> slash football players. He's like basically yes. superhuman. So if Mbappe has Ego waffles, then seven-year-olds can yes. also have Ego waffles. And I don't know if he has Ego waffles, but I think it's ah! really important. I mean, I just said <laughs> <laughs> to him. And Another now he loves lesson learned in yeah, parenting. It, it got him to eat <laughs> breakfast. But it, it's really important that we give ourselves a little grace. It's going to be hard at every level. I remember when I first was a parent, I was just like, okay, it'll be easier once he starts crawling. Oh, then it'll be easier once he starts walking. Oh, it'll be easier once he starts talking and going to school. Every stage had its own challenges. And I changed with every stage. And you're going to continue to do that throughout parenting. And that's not, that's a actually a blessing because it allows you to expand and it allows you to make mistakes and it allows you um, to be more honest with yourself and everyone around you. And your kid's going to be fine. Your kid is going to be absolutely fine because also one of the most important things for a mother to remember is that the biggest indicator of whether your child is happy, well-adjusted, does well in school, um, meets all, all of their you know, milestone criteria, is whether a mom is happy and happy in her own life. The research tells us this. So a happy mom really has a better chance of having a happy, successful, well-adjusted child. So I think it's also really important for moms to focus on their needs and what makes them happy and what makes them feel like they are living an authentic life that that they want to live. Put on your own life best first, <laughs> yes. right? I mean, yes. one must, one must. Mm-hmm. You, you are 
amazing. You are reflecting knowledge that you have learned under your own roof and from thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And those of us who do this work and you are included in it um, are the beneficiaries of all the parents who share their knowledge and their successes and their failures with us. And one of the most fun parts of this podcast is the ability to amplify all of those other parents' messages to an even broader group because none of us have a secret key to unlock the door to parenting perfection. All of us are learning from one another and from the world around us. And um, thank you for sharing your lessons. Incredible. Thank you for having me. You guys are great. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Erica. Thank you so much for listening. You can email us with questions, feedback, or episode requests at podcast at lessawkward.com. If you want to learn more about what we do to make this whole stage of life less awkward for everyone involved, our parent membership, our school health ed curriculum, our keynote talks, and more are all at lessawkward.com. And if you want products that make puberty so much more comfortable, visit myoomla.com.